Uh, welcome to Syracuse University's Orange Experience, Tastes, Traditions, and Trends of Tea. Uh, my name is Corey Miller, and I'm the Executive Director, Events and Affinity Programs at the Office of Alumni Engagement. And before we begin today's program, we've got just a few reminders for our guest. Uh, first, we are pleased to provide closed captioning during this program. Please see the Zoom chat for instructions on how to do this. You can open the chat by clicking it in your toolbar so that it stays up throughout this evening's program. This program is also being recorded, but if you don't want your image itself recorded, also see the Zoom chat for instructions on that, and you can simply disable the recording um, with your image in it. Uh, we'll be addressing questions later this evening, but anytime you have questions, please pop them in the chat. Kate Ludwig with the Office of Alumni Engagement will be collecting questions throughout the evening, and we will have time for a wonderful audience Q&A at the end of tonight's program. And our last, but definitely not least, housekeeping item, please check right now and make sure that you are indeed muted. Uh, we'd love if you have your video on so we can see who's joining us this evening, but if you can go ahead and keep yourself on mute and utilize the chat anytime you have questions, whether it's for our speakers, or of course, if you have any other questions um, for this evening or for the Office of Alumni Engagement, just use the Zoom chat for that. All right, wonderful. So now it is my pleasure to introduce this evening's panelist. Uh, first up, we have Todd Rubin, who's a 2004 SU graduate. He serves as the Minister of Evolution, the president for the Republic of Tea. It was founded in 1992 as a premium tea company dedicated to enriching people's lives through great tasting premium teas and herbs, education, and innovation. Since joining the company in 2007, Todd has successfully spearheaded new tea innovations and new systems throughout the organization that have led to incredibly significant growth. Tim Takis, a 1992 SU graduate, is the co-founder and director of Marulin, a UK tea company founded in 2016. Marulin's teas have won 10 Great Taste Awards, and the Guild of Fine Food recognizes the company as a great taste producer. Using a specially modified Taiwanese tea roaster, Mr. Tim's hand-roasted house oolong, roasted by Tim himself, won a great taste award earlier in 2020. And then last, but certainly not least, Dr. Ramita Ray, who is an associate professor of art history in the Department of Art and Music Histories, College of Arts and Sciences at Syracuse University. Her current research is centered on tea, viewed as an intersection between plants, science, animals, and art and architecture. Ramita is currently also working on a book manuscript about the visual cultures of tea in India, tentatively titled Leafy Wonders, Art, Science, and the Aesthetics of Tea in Colonial and Modern India. So as you can see, we have got three incredible speakers for tonight's program, very excited. Uh, before we jump into our panel discussion, we're gonna start things a little bit differently this evening. So now that we've introduced our three wonderful speakers, uh, we are going to sit back and enjoy what we're calling a lightning learning round from Todd, Tim, and Ramita. Each of them will have five minutes to tackle and share some fun facts and lessons about a particular aspect of tea or their personal background in the world of tea. We'll go in the following order. First up, we'll have Todd and then Tim, and then we'll have Rita. Um, I'll jump in, of course, when time's up. We have lots of great questions that we'll tackle in a panel discussion this evening. And then, as I had mentioned earlier, feel free to use the Zoom chat for other questions you might have. And we will have an audience Q&A at the end of the evening as well. So without further ado, Todd, you're up first. So I'm gonna hand over the mic to you. Thank you, Corey, and the Office of Alumni Engagement for hosting this event. Thank you all for attending this afternoon or wherever you are in the world. Uh, my name is Todd Rubin and I'm the Minister of Evolution at the Republic of Tea. I'm a 2004 SU grad of the School of Architecture. Since graduating, I've had the privilege to serve and give back to Syracuse University. I'm most proud of my recent support of the Blackstone Launchpad at SU Libraries through an innovation, diversity, and inclusion scholarship for Syracuse student entrepreneurs. I'm actively involved in the tea industry and I enjoy starting my day with a cup of lucky Irish breakfast. But this afternoon, I'm drinking our new Honeybush Vanilla Turmeric Super Digest Tea from my Syracuse mug. The Republic of Tea enriches people's lives through great tasting premium teas and herbs, innovation and education, emphasizing a sip by sip rather than gulp by gulp lifestyle. We were founded in 1992 by Mel and Patricia Ziegler, original founders of the Banana Republic Clothing Company, and it has been in our family for almost 27 years. They wrote a great book about starting the company as a whimsical country 
and borrowed the word republic from Banana Republic. The book is available as an ebook on Amazon if you're interested. We've had many firsts over the almost 29 years in business, including the first to offer USDA organic and elephant friendly certified teas, as well as offering over 300 great tasting premium teas and herbs. My part of our lightning round is to share with you the trends of tea. 40% of Americans are shifting toward eating more plant-based foods in which tea fits perfectly into this modern lifestyle, as tea is literally a plant in your cup. Tea appeals to all consumer demographics and is consumed anywhere and anytime. It has a great artisanal aspect from unique growing regions, which Tim will touch on. Tea is also viewed as natural and supports health and wellness. About four in five of all consumers drink tea with 87% of millennials being the most likely to enjoy tea. On our next slide, during the pandemic, there has been growth in the specialty food and beverage category focusing on immune boosting, anti-inflammatory and stress relieving herbs. Many of our tea blends include these trending ingredients such as elderberry, echinacea and turmeric. It's amazing to see the growth in elderberry, almost 300% in the last year. At the Republic of Tea, we continue to be on the forefront of innovation with on-trend ingredients. Consumers are recognizing digestive health is something that can have a direct impact on immunity. Probiotics and fermentation act to support digestive health and we have developed the first line of teas in the marketplace to include a heat safe probiotic called DE111. Our organic super digest tea collection addresses these consumer insights and demands. We are also proud of our recent award winning teas of our collagen promoting daily beauty and our adaptogenic based burnout blocker. This is like winning the Oscar in the beverage category. As we kick off the new year, I'm excited to give you a sneak preview of our newest teas that are not even in stores yet. We are building on the trend of immunity with two new health boosting blends with innovative ingredients. Our Aronia Elderberry Rooibos Super Digest Tea, the mouthful, includes Aronia berries, which top all other berries for antioxidant content. This tea has elderberry and is a wellness superhero. Our Get Protected Herb Tea is inspired by four thieves from France who created a spice mixture to protect themselves from the Black Plague in the early 15th century. This head clearing blend of spices supports everyday wellness. Also, as consumers focus on their diet and reducing sugar, we have developed a line of keto-friendly iced teas that are calorie-free sweetened with organic monk fruit. Hopefully you can enjoy those in the Syracuse summers. As I mentioned at the start, we are always innovating at the Republic of Tea and I have a lot more planned for the more premium teas and herbs this year, so stay tuned. I'd like to close that in our charter, we state that we are mindful of the impact that our actions and business have on communities and environment. We conscientiously act in a long-term and responsible manner. Our recent philanthropic support is impacting the lives of 12,000 people in the tea communities in Sri Lanka. Our ministers, or as we call our employees, envisioned and spearheaded a program called the Women of Tea Sri Lanka, which supports better nutrition, hygiene, and financial literacy to these tea communities. All of our premium teas and herbs are available in round, natural, unbleached tea bags, free of excess staples, strings, and tags. We are proud of our environmental impact by keeping waste out of landfills. If each, a fun fact, if each tea bag of the 159 million Americans that sip tea daily had a string, that amount of string would be the same distance between Syracuse and Calcutta where Professor Ray grew up. With that, I'll transition over to Tim.
Thank you, Todd. That was a very enlightening um, discussion. I really appreciate being on a panel with somebody else who's involved in the tea world and uh, part of a family business that gives so much back to the world. Um, I'm, I'm class of 92. Uh, I, my undergrad degrees are in economics and psychology. And uh, unfortunately, I haven't been in Syracuse very much recently. I live in London. But the best I can do to compliment Todd is to have this little creature next to me, Otto, of course, who Ramita gave to me. So we'll hear from her later and hear her stories about Otto. So the, although I'm in London, if you look behind me, there's a tea garden. Um, while tea does grow in the UK, um, it's not very successful as a product here to be grown. Um, the tea garden behind me is actually the tea garden of my business partner, Chow Jin, who has had a fourth generation tea garden in Taiwan, Nantau County. So this is the genesis of this um, particular business that I'm involved with now called Maru Lin. Um, so how did I get to the tea world? And that's kind of an interesting journey for me. And as I, as I look back and reflect of how I've come into the tea world, um, you know, I started off uh, with probably my first cup of tea with my grandmother in Edmonton, Canada. And she was an, a, a lover of Lipton tea, uh, sort of a standard tea in the US and Canada, um, drunk with milk and sugar. Very lovely to, to kind of know that and, and have that. Um, and then there was a period of time where I lived in Boulder, Colorado, uh, growing up And Boulder, Colorado is the home of Celestial Seasonings, which is, you know, a, a large US brand um, owned by Boulder Brands. And uh, they have a number of innovative and interesting um, different blends and mixes and things. So I got exposed a little bit in that setting. Um, then, you know, while it's not directly related to tea, I think what really opened me up to thinking about trying different experiences, trying different things, was a course I took at Syracuse um, called Cross-Cultural Psychology. And it really helped me understand more around different cultures, understanding their points of view and understanding different flavors that might come up in those particular cultures and not being afraid to try them. Um, after graduation, I ended up doing a, pro um, a program in Singapore. Um, and this was with what was called DIP at the time, which is now Syracuse Abroad, as you know. Uh, and I was exposed to my first Asian teas, which uh, really had an amazing flavor profile that I began to appreciate. Um, Later on in life, I'd had a, my first trip to Japan where I started to experience matcha, not just as a drink, but included as an ingredient in all sorts of different things, which, you know, really exposed me to different concepts that tea could be used, not just as a hot beverage, but as an ingredient, which I think is very exciting. Um, since then, I've moved to London. I've been in London since 1999, and um, I had to say I took a slight step backwards in some of the tea drinking that I experienced here. Uh, there was a lot of what's called builder's tea here, which is, you know, pretty uh, plain flat tea um, that needs to be cut with milk and sugar and it has to go back with some of the traditions in tea in this particular country. But there's yet innovation and yet new products coming in from all over the world here. So I was exposed to more of those things. Um, and then I met uh, my partner, Chow Jin, um, whose family owns a, a tea garden in Nantau County. And we basically um, were thinking about how this traditional tea garden that's been owned for so long could be brought into um, business in the rest of the world. Traditionally, the tea had always been sold wholesale and loose leaf in Taiwan. And we started to think about, you know, how could we develop a brand, a brand around this tea garden? And we forged a partnership with our fun tea inspector card called Reeves the Muntjac, which I'll explain a little bit later. So we forged Marlin as a company um, in 2016, and we now have a wholesale business as well, which um, sells uh, tea to different companies um, uh, in the UK, Europe, and the rest of the world. Um, so if we go on to the next slide, I can explain a little bit more about Marlin. So who we are is really about a heritage in tea. Um, so if you start from sort of the left of the slide, uh, uh, Dr. Lin, Newman Lin is uh, the tea gardener who is there, who uh, is um, Chow Jin's father. Um, he has been in this business since a child. Um, he emigrated to the US and uh, now is also looking to 
ways for him to expand this business and make this business more interesting. Beneath that's a picture of uh, Chow Jin and myself in this tea garden. Um, and what we also do is we do some artisanal pr production. So in the middle of the slide is now uh, Uncle Lin who produces some of the tea in a small factory that's not very far from the garden. And then we see um, some of the tea making processes that go on to make small batch artisanal tea from Taiwan that's very tasty. Um, so the, the premise of the company is tea from our farms and friends. So clearly, you know, this great tea asset exists of having a farm that different teas can be made from. The company primarily specializes in oolong teas, which is a very famous tea in Taiwan for very particular reasons. And if those of you don't know the differences between certain teas, you know, there's obviously green tea, which you might be aware of, and there's black tea. And those terms relate to the oxidation period that a tea goes through. So oxidation is when you have a leaf that sits out in the sun and it withers. So if you had a, a say a piece of spinach that sat in your windowsill, it's green when it starts off and becomes black after it sits there for some time. Oolong tea would sit in the middle of that where it's partially oxidized. And then we stop the oxidation through a series of steps, which basically allowed you to produce um, some very tasty floral teas that have very complex flavor profiles. The tea I'm drinking today is actually an apple brandy tea, which comes from a particular reg region of Taiwan called Sun Moon Lake, which isn't that far from where this tea, tea garden is. And it has flavor profiles of both apple and brandy at the same time. So what we've been able to do is be able to make relationships with a lot of small scale farmers in Taiwan um, and you know, increasingly in other parts of the world too, but you know, Taiwan is the focus. Uh, bring some of those unique small scale farmer artisanal teas to market in the UK and other countries and introduce people to those. And so some of the things we've been able to do is actually introduce the concept of tea roasting as a secondary process in the UK to add sort of an additional artisanal approach to it. So if you see there's a picture there of sort of a bamboo basket, that's me roasting some of the tea that I won a great taste award for this year. Um, and we try to explain the concept of oolong and some of these teas you know, in various settings to different people. And um, if you look at this, this is a picture of a farmer there that we know. And then uh, interestingly, one of the cafes that serves our tea, um, uh, Camilla came into and visited and had some tea there, which was absolutely fantastic experience for all of us. And it was something that made a, you know, some international headlines when it, uh, th those photos came out. Um, so that's really um, what we're trying to do as, as Maro Lin as a company. Um, and then if we go into the next slide, I can explain a little bit more about the brand. So, you know, we're really about this heritage um, part of the, the, the of what we do. So if you look at the logo there on the picture in the left, uh, essentially you see a logo there of our company. And that logo has a, a circle in it with a symbol on that. That's the symbol for the, the name Lin. Um, and basically, uh, there's a circle around that, and that circle uh, represents the Chinese chop, the, the stamp that um, basically the family used to use when they traded with the Japanese under the Japanese colonial period in, in Taiwan. So effectively, that symbol is a modernized version of the historical stamp that was used. On the side of the packaging there, you also see um, a sort of a crisscross pattern, and that's a crisscross pattern of basically a bamboo tea basket or a bamboo tea roaster that is often used to cradle and hold tea, you know, as or while it's being processed. So we're trying to bring some of this heritage in around the tea farming, the tea processing into our brand. Um, and if you think about this, uh, we also have sort of a colonial angle to this as well and kind of recognizing that colonialism has been something that affected many people all over the world. And it's something just to, to re recognize that that's, you know, part of life and part of you know, our history and our heritage. So, um, you know, that's why we have basically this, you know, heritage brand of Maru Lin as being the name of the company. And then we also have, interestingly, a, our, our tea inspector, whose name is Reeves the Munchak, and there's a picture of him on the right, who basically is a representation of um, a creature who uh, basically immigrated to uh, Britain. So a Munchak is a small deer about the size of a dog. Um, and the Duke of 
uh, Bedford imported him to Britain uh, in the 1850s. And this is true, they escaped as a garden pet and now it's an invasive species in Britain and they're running through people's gardens here. Um, his name is Reeves because there's a variety of them called Reeves the Muntjac, which is named after John Reeves, who's a tea inspector from the East India Company. Um, and so this is trying to bring in some of this heritage of, you know, global cultures kind of interacting with one another and now we're part of the future. Um, and that's really what this is all about. So that's the summary of what um, I, I do with in the world of tea. Um, we have, a, I think, a very exciting and interesting company that has unique teas that are built around the flavor of the teas. And we focus on this artisanal heritage of tea production and finding small scale producers who have unique products. Perfect. All right, Ramita, would you like to jump in for your part now? Sure. Great, uh, hi, you. everyone. Um, I am unmuted, right? Yes, we can hear you. You're all set. <laughs> Terrific. Well, thank you, Corey and Liz, for inviting me. And uh, thank you, everyone, for coming out on a cold, wintry evening, at least in Syracuse. You may be in a different part of the world, uh, much warmer than we are here. And special thanks to uh, Todd and Tim for their wonderful presentations. I've known them uh, both now over the years. I've gotten to know them. So it's great fun uh, to do this for you. And it's the magic of Zoom, right, that brings us together uh, from across the world. So I'm going to take you back in time. I'm an art historian, as Corey mentioned. I also work on architectural history. Uh, I'll be talking about India a little bit, but I thought I would take you uh, back to the 18th century. Let's see, I'm supposed to be able to, here we go. Back to the 18th century uh, slash early 19th century with this very intriguing object, which happens to be in the art collections at Syracuse University. So I thought for those of you who are alums, uh, you should see this object that hides in storage. Otherwise, it is a tea caddy made out of wood lined with tortoise shell. And you can also see that it has two canisters. So they're boxes within boxes. And each of the canisters is stopped with a mother of pearl knob. And actually these two knobs are my favorite detail. Uh, they're cut in a floral pattern and keep the word flower in your heads, please. Now, the other very interesting aspect of this box is that you see a keyhole, which immediately tells you that this is a box that was kept under lock and key. The reason being that Chinese tea, which is a tea we are going to be talking about today, and uh, I think Tim's presentation leads quite nicely into mine, Chinese tea was an extremely expensive product uh, at this time very much a luxury item, which deserved a luxury box, right? A really luxurious object like this. And if you notice with even the tortoise shell panels, each panel is cut to size and then perfectly aligned. And the shape of the box that we're seeing here was directly inspired by 18th century French cabinetry, French furniture. Uh, so a high luxury object, meant to fit into a very beautiful environment that invited you to open this box. It's like a jewelry box. You open it after unlocking it. There's a mystery about it. You smell the tea, you touch the tortoise shell. By the way, tortoise shell literally comes from a tortoise or a turtle and it is banned now ever since 2014. Uh, so you can see these sort of multiple sensory layers uh, that uh, comprise this box and invite you to partake of tea. One other thing I want to point out is that I want you to imagine this tea caddy next to porcelain, next to silver, next to all the tea accoutrements that would shape the spectacle, the ritual of a tea party. So boxes like this or a fine porcelain teacup would have been part of literally the ritual of drinking tea, but also the choreography of the body, right? When you drink tea, uh, you're much more conscious of drinking something hot than you are perhaps of something at room temperature. Uh, so just your gestures, your mannerisms would shift. So anyway, so here's a box to sort of kickstart our discussion, so to speak. And then on to, sorry about that, 
a different kind of box, a box that is rather controversial. And this should be an incident that all of you are familiar with. Uh, it is part and parcel of American history, the Boston Tea Party for you here. And you can see that there are boxes of tea, a very different box. This is a container containing loose leaf tea again, being dumped into uh, the Atlantic Ocean on a very cold wintry evening on December 16th, 1773. There were five different kinds of teas that were dumped into uh, Griffin's Wharf. And I like to think of this picture very much as an image that reminds you of Griffin Wharf in the Boston Harbor, becoming like a, a giant teacup of sorts, right? So you literally have this storm in a teacup, you have this tea being dumped there, the, the salty water becomes like this uh, tea that's being brewed in the water. And the, the Sons of Liberty that evening and also Boston citizens participated in destroying in what is to, in today's terms, almost $1.6 million worth of tea. 340 chests were broken and dumped into uh, the Atlantic Ocean that evening. Miraculously, two boxes have survived, one of which is in the Boston Tea Party Museum, and I'm showing it to you here. Uh, it's not very large, it looks huge in this picture, but it's, um, it's, it's, a, it's a small chest, let me put it this way. And it's a reminder of the mobility of wealth. Tim mentioned the East India Company, the Chinese teas that were dumped into the Boston Harbor all were imported from the East India Company, all right? So the East India Company is supplying this tea. The ships, however, were American made, uh, just so you know. So anyways, the mobility of wealth. So tea represents at this point a form of extremely lucrative wealth that is now traveling across oceans. It's traveling to ports all over. Um, and how is it traveling? That's the other question we need to ask. We've seen the tea chest. Very interestingly, at this point, it's traveling from Canton uh, or Guangzhou. And uh, a shout out to Tammy Hong, who is an alum of my department, who I know is online. She's originally from Guangzhou. Uh, and it would travel from there all the way to uh, the ports of Calcutta. It would travel to Madras. Um, prior to that, it may even touch upon Singapore. Uh, sail around the coast of Africa, go to London, and then get shipped out to Boston, to Philadelphia, to Charleston. Now, we usually think of tea as, as an edible product, but in the 18th century, tea was also a very prized botanical. And this meant that East India ship company, um, sorry, East India company ship captains were oftentimes asked or commissioned by very famous naturalists. You may have heard of Carl Linnaeus, uh, who started the Linnaean classificatory system. Uh, Linnaeus fa famously commissioned East India Company captains to bring him tea all the way from China. Uh, and tea would be then carried in boxes. This is this, I'm talking about the plant itself. Uh, tea seeds were also carried in boxes. And this is a wonderful volume. This is a, an 18th century manual uh, of directions for carrying both the seeds as well as plants from the East Indies, different sizes. You can see this uh, box with multiple compartments in it. This one would have contained seeds and it would have been lined with what's called silk paper with Chinese silk and the, the tea seeds would have been nestled in that box. Uh, the other container with the saplings has uh, tea saplings embedded in moss, for instance. The boxes would have also been placed within other containers which were sealed off. Uh, there are ship captains who have given us directions from the 18th century about how to make sure that the wooden boxes were always meant to be unscented wood because tea is extremely sensitive uh, to the smells around it. So it can actually absorb um, the smells of its container. So in order to protect it, there would be unscented wood. And what I find particularly fascinating about this is that it tells you a lot about the persistence of the history of botany at this time or natural history. Uh, there were umpteen number of requests for these plants to be shipped out. And so what you have is a history of technology, boxes themselves cater to the history of technology. You have the history of plant science. Uh, all these fields are now slowly, um, shall we say, cementing as uh, these different kinds of discoveries are being made. Oftentimes the plants turned out to be frauds. They turned out to be hoaxes. 
And how did the person know that this was a hoax? At the end of the journey, if the team made it, um, keep in mind that, you know, we are talking about a very long journey over several months. There were rodents on the ship, there was salty air, there was stormy weather. So it was a miracle if the plant actually made it intact or the seeds made them uh, appeared intact at the other end of the journey. So I'm gonna just quickly flag a celebrity tea plant for you, which was planted here very successfully or transplanted, I should say, at Cyan House Conservatory. Uh, this is part of the Duke of Northumberland's estate right outside of the main city of London. You can visit it even today. And the plant in question, as I mentioned, is a very famous plant of the time. Hold on, here we go. Uh, it was published, it was actually so famous. This is like a portrait of a very famous plant. And it adorns what we call a frontispiece, uh, which is the page across from the title page. Again, it's an 18th century volume published by a medical doctor named John Coakley Latsum. And you can tell from the illustration that it's absolutely magnificent. I'm showing this to you, here's a detail. Um, uh, for you over here. I'm showing this to you in particular uh, because it shows a flowering plant. And remember I asked you to keep the word flower in your heads. Here is the tea flower. The naturalist who would receive this plant, let's say Linnaeus, for instance, had this experience. He commissions these tea plants uh, to be sent over, they flower or they don't flower and he realizes that they're fraudulent. So the flower actually is the key to the camellia species here. So what we're seeing is the Camellia sinensis um, plant, which is uh, the scientific name for it. And I'm showing you uh, an actual photograph of the tea flower, which has white petals. And then the stamens uh, are yellow. So the filaments themselves are yellow. And you've got this beautiful orange tip or the anther uh, that holds the pollen for the plant. So a magnificent illustration, which by the way, in the 18th century was hand colored. So there was an artist who went in and applied watercolor to each and every one of the prints that was printed. It was that precious a plant that it deserved this kind of space. I don't want to get into too many details about botanical illustration. There's a lot to tell you about this. So I'm just going to move on. If there are questions later on, I can answer them. But I wanted to show you that, you know, this botanical has then you know, other, other histories that grow out of it, literally, that emerge from it. And there's a wonderful uh, pattern, a design that's inspired by the tea plant called the tea plant pattern that's um, produced by the Chelsea Porcelain Factory, which is next to the Chelsea Botanical Garden, also a great garden of botanical research in London. And you can see here that the plant has in fact been now reimagined as a vine, which wraps around this uh, white porcelain vessel. And the artist, of course, has taken it, the person who colored the, the, the design has taken it to a new height uh, instead of the white flowers that I showed you earlier, sorry, white flowers that I showed you earlier. Uh, we now have brightly colored um, pinks and oranges. So reimagine the tea plant for this particular vessel. And just so we don't lose sight of the fact that the tea plant continues to inspire great design, and it's all connected. You have the botanical history and the design history connected because both uh, grew up side to side and in conversation with each other. I just wanted to make sure that you all, uh, again, saw bits and pieces of the plant on this Republic of Tea canister. And you already saw Tim showing you this particular canister with uh, the tea leaves at the bottom. And I have to say that there is no other plant commodity, not even coffee or chocolate, uh, which are the rival commodities, I would say that have inspired an iconic uh, graphic for the tea plant. So the tea plant continues to inhabit our imagination through art and design, as well as, of course, the history of science. So I'll end with that now. Thank you for your time. Wonderful. Thank you, Ramita. All right, we're going to uh, close out that slide and get the four of us on screen so we can jump right into our discussion. Uh, bear with me for just a second. There we go. All right. Um, so the first question that I wanted to jump right in and ask is obviously we know that January is National Hot Tea Month. Um, so happy National Hot Tea Month to everyone that joined us this evening. I can tell by the really active chat and, and all the great questions coming in that we have loads of experienced tea drinkers joining us tonight, which is great to see. Uh, that being said, um, I did wanna jump in. Obviously we're all setting New Year's resolutions. Uh, and as we set those New Year's resolutions around health and wellness, can each of you maybe weigh in with a couple of the top health benefits uh, and maybe different health benefits for various types of tea? And of course, the big question in the room, 
How does that compare to coffee? <laughs> Who'd like to jump in first? Todd, do you wanna maybe jump in and get us started on that one? Sure, that's great. Uh, so there's, I know I, I noticed I was reading some of the great questions that you all have. And one thing about tea is as um, Romita mentioned, the Camellia sinensis is the plant, but there's four types of tea that come from that plant from production process. So there's black tea, green tea, oolong tea, and white tea. They're all from the same species plant, but they're all produced different ways. And each of them have different type of health benefits. So you're probably aware of antioxidant is a, a big term and you find that in all of tea, but the longer you process a tea, like a black tea, you lose some of those antioxidants. So green and white teas are rich in antioxidants. Uh, but then on the other spectrum, for those who are coffee drinkers that we wanna convert to tea drinkers, uh, if you're used to that caffeine, uh, we always recommend starting with a black tea because tea has about half as much caffeine compared to a cup of coffee. But the one thing to note is you might uh, have read recently, uh, there's a buzzword uh, uh, in the industry uh, trend, L-theanine. And L-theanine is the type of caffeine that it, it comes uh, from tea. And the tea caffeine is different from the coffee caffeine. So the tea caffeine of L-theanine gives you that calm state of alertness. It's an even keel caffeine where when you have your coffee, it kind of gives you that instant jolt. Um, and at the Republic of Tea, we like to call that tea mind. Uh, so <laughs> it's a little bit about caffeine and, and antioxidants, uh, Corey. Perfect. Uh, Tim, uh, did you want to jump in with uh, any other ideas or thoughts about health benefits for different types? That overview couldn't be better. I think, you know, the thing All to right. think about is, you know, what could you be drinking other than tea and <laughs> what type of tea are you drinking? And that's a good comparison to this as well. And so, you know, some of the things that we've been trying to do is make teas so you don't have to cut them with milk and sugar, which is what a lot of people in Britain do, for example. And so many people want to reduce sugar and milk from their diet. So in order to do that, you know, often need to have teas with more complex flavor profiles, which enable you to not have to change the flavor of them. So I think that's a really important kind of characteristic to consider um, as you're picking your tea, you know, to pick something that really tastes good. And I think in these interesting times that we're in, and we're sitting at home in front of Zoom calls like this, you need to have that time to relax and enjoy yourself and, you know, have a simple pleasure. And tea is the perfect way to do that. Absolutely. Well, and you make a great point, Tim, which segues into another question for tonight. All of us obviously have been spending more time at home than we ever have before since this prior March. And we're battling these really long winter days and these long cold winter nights. And what kind of tea do you think is the right tea for that kind of occasion? And maybe it's just how you select a tea for yourself, or if you're trying to maybe pick the right tea and match make for a friend or a family member. Well, I think it's actually a very complex question. And I think you mm. could sort of look at that in, in terms of, you know, wine pairings, right, as well. So, you know, we've been involved in a number of different activities where we try to pair teas with different types of, say, chocolates or different types of foods. And I think that's really kind of the, the right way to do it. So I think, you know, if you thought about, you know, what's often done in the world of wine, where you have one of these flavor wheels, the same exists in the tea world. And, mm -hmm. you know, you can get if you have a really good tea multiple different notes and flavors out of it and if you can pair that appropriately with whatever you're having um, for food you know that's sort of a nice synergy to enjoy as well Absolutely. also with tea uh, not only can you drink tea but you can also use it as an ingredient and you can cook with tea uh, mm -hmm. so you can make a tea concentrate by you know, steeping a couple of tea bags or more full leaf loose tea, and you could make a, a syrup out of it. You, a lot of people are probably familiar with matcha, which is a ground Japanese green tea powder. And a lot of people like to cook with matcha. So you take some matcha and you add it to a pint of vanilla ice cream. You have green tea ice cream. Mm -hmm. uh, so tea is very versatile. I guess to build on your point then, um, you know, if you're talking about you know the consumption of these beneficial ingredients when you're consuming the entire tea leaf you get more of those beneficial ingredients right so you consume the entire leaf rather than, than steeping it so one of the things that we've done that was a little bit different in the uk i know this exists in the us and some other places too but we've powderized other types of tea so matcha is obviously very well known as being 
powdered green tea from Japan that's used as a cooking ingredient and things like that. But other types of tea can be powderized and used as well, which add different sorts of flavors. And in fact, you know, there's even ways to cook with the entire leaf. So putting sort of a, a fried oolong into a salad or into an omelet is, you know, very interesting way to enjoy your tea and add a different flavor to your food as well. Absolutely. Well, I, I, there's tons of great questions coming in the chat, but Ramita, I wanted to ask you specifically because it just popped in the chat and ties in with what we were talking about mm -hmm. uh, around benefits or um, physical effects of tea on the body and how people thought about this in the past. Ah, this is from my colleague and friend, Amanda Winkler. Amanda, hi, Amanda. <laughs> Thanks, Amanda. Great question. Uh, who is the chair of the Department of Art and Music Histories as well. Um, all right, so the physical impact of tea. I was actually going to tell you a little bit about, uh, I was going to comment on things that Tim was saying, so I'm going to have to uh, keep that in my head. But going to Amanda's okay. question first, um, what's quite interesting at this time, and I'm glad you asked this question, is that Chinese tea is a bit of a controversial product in the 18th century. Keep in mind that because the Chinese government is uh, charging very high taxes for, for uh, selling tea actually, or they're, they're not willing to, let me put it this way, uh, do a straightforward barter with uh, the Brits or with the Europeans. So the British, for instance, try to sell their woolens to the Chinese who basically reject them and they ask for silver. So there's a lot of anxiety, economic anxiety about tea draining uh, the treasuries, right? Of, of, of not just Britain, but other countries as well. Uh, and it's very interesting that up until this economic uh, turn takes place, uh, there's a very strong sense of Chinese tea belonging to high culture. It's very refined, it's an imperial drink. Uh, so prior to this, there's, you know, Chinese tea is fabulous. You're basically drinking a very sophisticated drink, which it still is. But the economic controversy then shifts the needle, shall we say, a little bit. And what ends up happening is that we have these. Uh, we have a lot of cultural anxiety about the fact that if you drink Chinese tea, you will become Chinese. And there were these awful negative stereotypes about what the Chinese body was like or the Chinese person was like. Uh, and un I mean, in today's language, it would be un unspeakable, right? It would be very racist. Uh, but people uh, you know, would outline these thoughts in their books and we have publications about this, that you would become pusillanimous. That's actually a great word uh, if you play a uh, uh, Scrabble. Uh, I challenge you all to look that up if you don't know the meaning of that, but that's the one that sticks out. You'll be pusillanimous and cunning. I mean, these awful, awful stereotypes. Uh, so you would literally, your body would become Chinese. And Hogarth, William Hogarth, who's a very famous 18th century British artist, has a print where he shows you uh, this man who's, a, uh, who's shown as this very emaciated figure with a Mandarin pigtail, uh, who's meant to again symbolize uh, the danger of drinking Chinese tea. So there are a lot of mixed opinions about uh, the impact of it on your health. There are others who advocate for it at the same time. So it's interesting to see that the deeper, I'm going to uh, borrow from Todd's company, Logan, the more you sip Chinese tea in the 18th century, the more you get into it, uh, the more controversy bubbles up, by the way. So Great. can I just, by the way, add two more things to what Tim mentioned and Todd mentioned sure. about edibility. Todd, when you mentioned the matcha uh, tea story, the, the ice cream and green tea, it reminded me actually of a tea planter in Assam. Uh, I was having lunch with him and he had his cook make matcha kulfi, the kulfi being this very famous Indian ice cream as well. And I was absolutely floored. And it was kind of fun because I was in the middle of nowhere in Assam eating matcha kulfi in the middle of a plantation and matcha powder, of course, came from Japan. So, you know, you have these delightful experiences. Second fun fact, talking about tea leaves being uh, cooked. Uh, so on plantations in India, or tea gardens, as we call them, uh, you will also have uh, tea pakoras. So if you're familiar with pakoras, which are these fried fritters made out of chickpea flour, uh, which is a very popular Indian snack, uh, in tea gardens, they will actually make you tea pakoras. So instead of <laughs> finish leaves, they will actually have a tea pakora for you. And also the, uh, the leaves are roasted by um, tea workers as well, laborers mm -hmm. who also enjoy it as a snack. So. Okay, great, thank you. Um, Todd and Tim, I'd love to get you both to weigh in on this question. And we're getting a lot of questions relating to this in the chat. 
Uh, if I'm new to tea drinking, can you talk me through what are some of the tea essentials as far as kitchen tools, accessories, and also um, most importantly too, what are some tips and tricks for brewing different types of tea? Do you want to- get I can jump in. Uh, awesome, thank you. Yeah. Well, the most important thing is water and the type of water that you have. Mm -hmm. So we always recommend filtered water or spring water. Uh, so that's really important. Uh, and then the next step is how do you heat the water? Uh, I know some people like to use the microwave. I kind of say, you know, don't do that. I recommend a tea kettle. Uh, if you have a tea kettle over uh, your stove or if you have an electric tea kettle, uh, because tea is becoming so popular, I know some companies make tea kettles that actually have it to a certain temperature because the temperature of the water also affects the tea. So um, typically a black tea, which is a strong base tea or herbal teas, they take boiling water well, but with a green tea or a white tea, which are much more you know, refined leaves. Um, and also you wanna make sure that the water is short of boiling. So you know, how do you stop that? You could do it you know, through having a kettle that has the different temperatures, or if your water boils, just top it off with a little cold water. Uh, and then pour it over the leaves. And if you've had green tea before and you know you don't like it because it tastes bitter, uh, that's because the water is probably too hot or you've oversteeped it. And it's really important how you steep your tea because each tea has a certain amount of time. But again, uh, referencing back to what we like to say, the tea mind is is you know it's about creating your own ritual and your own personal tea ceremony and how you want to experience your tea. So. The great thing about tea is it's pretty forgiving, especially herbs. So, you know, I might like to steep my black tea for three minutes, but Tim might like his a little stronger uh, as living in London, you know, a little uh, <laughs> older of a tea, like five minutes. But again, you know, it's very fun to experiment with tea, add different things to it, or just enjoy it uh, by itself. So, Tim? I think that's perfectly said. I, I would say that, you know, if you're getting into tea, you can keep it as simple as you want. And that's really, you know, make it as easy as you want to, to make it. Buy a tea bag. That's that's okay. Um, but experiment. The beauty of tea is there's different types of tea. There's different brands. There's different flavors. And it's experimenting, right? Nobody buys the same bottle of wine, you know, over and over again. They always want to try something different. The same is with tea. So, you know, try some different varieties. I guess what I would like to add to that though is when you get to some of the, the sort of more whole leaf teas, so obviously teas um, are processed in different ways and you have some very finely ground teas um, often referred to CTC teas, which you find in the very lower quality tea bags is cut tear curl. Um, and you know, if you open those up, it's, it's basically dust and you can use them once and that's it. No, which is which is okay, but you know if you want to avoid waste and things, you know that's your your prerogative. Um, but you know if you get to the better quality teas that are made from the entire leaf, hand picked or machine picked, it's still okay. You can brew them many times, right? So you don't have to actually throw your tea bag away after your first use. If you have a very good whole leaf tea, you know you can brew it all day long. So I'm on my fourth cup of tea at the moment from the same three grams of this apple brandy tea I'm drinking right now because it's a whole leaf tea and you continue to get flavors out of it, you know, even after the fourth brew. And sometimes that flavor profile changes slightly over time. And, you know, if you think about that too, in terms of the caffeine we were talking about, you're, you're, the caffeine you consume does also go down over time too. So if you're worried about having too much caffeine late at night, you know, have your sixth brew late at night, like I'm having right now. Yeah. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, I'd love to also jump in, and obviously we got to hear some fun facts from Ramita about some historical aspects of tea. What about the future of tea? Can, um, can you maybe talk us through, we know that there's instant teas, bubble tea, we've had some questions pop up in the chat about matcha tea. Um, it was mentioned earlier using it even in cooking, but it, as tea continues to evolve, what do each of you from your perspective see the future of tea looking like? I'm the wrong person to ask this question okay. of because well, I'd, I'd say you know <laughs> I'm extremely Catholic about my tea. I don't want a future. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, well, there's, there's a point I was about to make as well, Ramita. So you mm -hmm. know, there's the future, future, and there's heritage, and mm -hmm. um, you know, in many ways, some of the culture that's been brought up around tea has started mm -hmm. to disappear in some places. So, you know, in particular, um, the sort of 
situation in Taiwan is it's primarily small scale family farmers. Um, so it's not a situation like in India where you have these plantations as we we're discussing before the call, right? It's, it's, mm. it's really small scale artisanal farmers. And, you know, as a country or a place begins to develop, you know, people migrate to the cities and it's hard to find young people who want to tea farm. They'd rather develop an app or go into investment banking or something, right? So mm -hmm. how do you create and keep those heritages uh, alive of some really, you know, creative ways of making something and attracting people back into the business? So there's a, there, there's a heritage to it, but there is also a future to it as well. And so, you know, I, I do agree there's different trends that exist out there. You know, bubble tea is an amazing one. Also, you know, originating from Taiwan, it's taken over the world. You know, some really fantastic creativity has been put into making all these different bubble tea drinks and, you know, all the infinite permutations you can have into having exactly the drink you want in your hands, you know, after it's been made. So, you know, that certainly is a future to it. But I do believe as well that, you know, tea as, as an ingredient is another kind of key Part of the future but you know let's face it this is still the most widely drunk mm -hmm. product or drink in the world after water so you know you know the future is still around right the future and the her heritage still do exist yeah and and can i just jump in here for a minute i'm glad you mentioned the word heritage um tim because you know when you're drinking your tea one has to remember that it's coming from a very far away place right you're talking about a tea garden somewhere out in uh, Sri Lanka, it could be, you could be drinking African tea, you could be drinking Chinese tea, Indian tea, whatever. But uh, as um, Todd mentioned, water is absolutely critical, boiling water, hot boiling water, but so is soil, so is the climate. So tea is very much like the wine tasting business, right? The viticulture, you know, it depends on the terroir. It depends literally on all these factors which then produce the leaf that you are drinking or you know you're consuming at the end of the chain so you're literally drinking an entire environment you are soaking in uh you know the culture of a tea garden right so if you go to certain tea gardens or if you go to a botanical garden uh well there's a botanical laboratory for tea growing in india uh, they may have a mother bush the original tea bush from which all the bushes came or have been cloned or you know uh, 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 have been developed. So this question of heritage is very interesting. It's not just a buzzword. It's actually deep in the, it's deeply embedded in the plant itself. And it's not just terroir, it's also about how it's produced afterwards, right? So oh my gosh, absolutely. You, know, you, you could have the exact same plant yeah. from the same tea garden and one could be produced in a very bad way and somebody would be in a very yeah. tasty way. Yeah, and mm -hmm. it'll taste different in different yeah. places depending on the water quality. Mm -hmm. And you know, when I say that it's coming from the tea garden, a tea garden, a plantation is a biosphere at the end of the day. It has a wonderful ecosystem. You've not only got the tea plant, you have shade trees, you have other plants uh, that pour nitrogen back into the soil and you have animals. This is the wonderful mm -hmm. thing, especially about tea gardens in, uh, in India is that you're living with wildlife. Anything from uh, tigers to leopards to wild elephants trekking through, uh, Tim mentioned elephant friendly tea, there are birds, there are butterflies, this creates an entire environment for the tea to flourish in. Right. So there's one very interesting type of tea, Ramita, that's called oriental beauty tea, if you're familiar with it, and that really requires a biodynamic um, environment for it to be produced. And so Absolutely. effectively, you have your tea growing. But you need to have a certain type of insect, a small grasshopper called the jessine, oh, that's who, bite, who bites the leaves right. and starts some oxidation process and makes the tea very, very tasty. So, <laughs> you know, in those cases, you know, whether it's branded as organic or not, you know, you can't grow that tea mm -hmm. unless you have insects there interacting with the plant. Um, and, right. you know, it, it really produces a beautiful uh, type of tea. Power to the grasshopper. Hey, Todd, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Todd, obviously I want to make sure you get to weigh in yeah. on the future of tea because if the Republic of Tea is known for anything, it's creating yeah. tea trends and products. So I'd love to get your thoughts. Yeah, I think I shared a few, but uh, you know, when we talk about tea as, as we're talking about the Camellia sinensis, but also with tea, there's herbal tea. And so with herbal tea, you might have heard the term tisan. Um, and uh, that is herbal tea is just think of peppermint, you know, and um, the herbs are actually just, uh, we call it tea because you steep the herbs in hot water and boiling hot water. And so, you know, functional herbs are what is the future. Uh, and, and as I referred earlier, like turmeric is like these, you know, ancient herbs that, you know, we might cook with or we might mm. eat just adding in the hot water and this 
the different health benefits. And as I mentioned earlier, turmeric, you know, is great for anti-inflammatory. So people are looking to uh, healthy functions that you can enjoy, you know, by drinking tea, you don't have to take a supplement. You can just uh, get the benefits, some of the benefits through drinking the tea. Perfect, thank you. Um, so I'm actually gonna jump in. Uh, Kate for me is gonna put some important uh, links and information about some other upcoming events, programs, as well as most importantly, a really fantastic document that has special recommendations from both Todd and Tim about teas that you might wanna start sipping. Uh, she'll pop the link in there and that does include uh, exclusive discounts to both the Republic of Tea and Maroulin Tea Company. So just in case folks do have to run uh, right at seven o'clock, please check out the chat, make sure you save that. There will be a survey email that's also sent and we'll again, uh, again include that really wonderful document with tea recommendations and the discount codes. And yes, Luke's, we are recording it. Um, so feel free to email me directly. Uh, Kate will put my email right in the chat for us. And definitely if you would like to get a recording after the fact, I'm happy to share that um, one off with any individuals who would like to get that. Um, that being said, we are going to go over and try to get to some of our audience questions. Our speakers have graciously agreed to stay on a bit longer. So for those that can stick around with us, Please do. I know we are not going to get through all of these. There are too many great questions, but we will do our best and tackle a few of them. Um, we love to see the enthusiasm in such an active chat. Uh, so one of our first questions, um, and to be fair, I'm going to try to go in order with some of these, uh, was a question about experimenting with matcha and having trouble getting the preparation correct and definitely getting some clumps each time they try it. Are there any, some, uh, any fun tips for making matcha that you might want to share? Uh, it, I mean, if you use a whisk, it's better. Um, obviously, there's the bamboo sort of style whisks, which are popular in Japan, but there's also some sort of more automatic whisks that you can use uh, as well. I would also say temperature is important with matcha. Um, mm -hmm. That's definitely the one you don't want to do at a boiling temperature. I'd say take it down to, well, I'm thinking in centigrade, but um, probably about 85 degrees or so is about right. Okay, perfect. Uh, we also have a really great uh, question about, and if I mispronounce, uh, if I mispronounce it, I apologize. They're also asking about the pronunciation puer tea, um, and asking about uh, not not completely on board with that yet. They said, um, I think given the stronger flavor, I've tried it myself, and it definitely can be, maybe be an acquired taste for for newbies to the tea world. Um, but definitely wanted to uh, ask if there were any suggestions about maybe gateway puer varietals or ways to start to ease into getting used to that flavor and that tea. It's, it is an acquired taste. I, yeah. I've grown to like it over <laughs> the years. So the, the, the difference with that taste, it's, it's fermented in a way as well. So that's why it has that different sort of flavor and, and taste to it and it can be aged. So there's a really big history going on with poor tea. And you know there are people who trade and keep those poor bricks for years and trade them. Um, and it's you know, almost like trading in commodities in a sense. Mm -hmm. And there's uh, green puer as well as black puer. And so uh, black puer uh, is definitely stronger. Uh, some tobacco, some smoky notes, some, you know, some people have talked about, you know, old socks, you know, it has a very, mm. you know, <laughs> interesting taste, uh, but the, uh, the green uh, puer is a, a good gateway. Uh, Great. I, I've made some poor um, homebrew kombucha, which it, it tastes really good, actually. So if you want to try it that way, then it sweetens it out the flavor a little bit and still you get that, you know, raw sort of flavor that poor has. Perfect. Um, another great question, I think, uh, is there an advantage or disadvantage between loose tea or tea bags? Loose tea. <laughs> the traditionalists <laughs> like <said>. loose tea. <laughs> Uh, traditionalists like loose tea, and I think building on uh, what Tim had said earlier, with the loose tea, you actually have the whole surface area of the tea leaf. So you're getting all the essential oils that are released when you steep the tea, and then you can do multiple infusions. Where a tea bag, uh, it's the cut tea leaf, and so you don't have the full surface area. So it's difficult to do multiple infusions. But again, I think it's this whole experience uh, exploring adventure of, you know, trying loose leaf tree, trying tea bag tea. I think a lot of people are afraid of loose leaf tea. Um, and, you know, really you just need one extra step and that is having an infuser. So it's really mm -hmm. the same preparation, uh, but you need an infuser. The, the 
the tea bag uh, aids in that. But if you just have a metal strainer or if you have a teapot uh, or one of those, you know, tea balls, just add a teaspoon of full leaf tea, prepare it the same way, and you could do some multiple infusions. I think going back to your environmental points at the beginning, Todd, you know, if you want to be the most environmentally minded is do away with the extra packaging. We do offer tea bags. I, I know you do too as well. Ours are the mm -hmm. sort of silken tea bags are extra large. So the, the leaf does have a chance to open up in those, but um, you know, it's, it's really a choice. I mean, if you're a cafe or a restaurant or in a catering environment, it's very difficult to do loose leaf tea. So there are different circumstances for different people um, really and the environment they're in. But um, if it's my choice, I prefer the loose leaf. Um, when we're talking about some of the health benefits from earlier, is there a big difference between hot tea versus iced tea? Just looking at the brewing. So there, there's two different, I mean, Todd, you go ahead if you want. I've, I've got some. Go ahead. On. Okay. Go so ahead. Yeah. I'd guess, you know, from there's iced tea, which is, you know, often the ready to drink teas that are served in canisters, which often have various um, sugars, other things added to them. They're hot filled, so it's brewed hot. I guess the, the sort of a counter to that is that cold brewing is a very popular trend now. So taking, you know, some amount of tea, putting it into water, leaving it overnight, um, you know, whether it's still water or sparkling water or mineral water, um, that's a way you can kind of brew your tea over a longer term and maybe get more out of it. And you don't have to add anything extra to it, but that's doing it yourself. Most of those types of teas aren't available in the, in the store, but that's a, a way you can have a cold tea, but not have any added extras. Great. Um, another question, this completely shifts gears, but I love this, um, and this is for you, Ramita. Uh, what's the strangest or most interesting object that you've come across so far in your tea-related research? <laughs> oh my God, that's a great question. You know, the strangest object. Uh, I don't think I've found anything particularly strange. I found wonderful teapots, uh, which of course, you know, I'm sure many of you collect. Uh, the, the most interesting objects, I will say this, let me reframe the question if I may. Uh, the most interesting objects which I've come across which are unexpected were dried tea specimens, um, which are housed in herbaria, right? So I've actually looked at a lot of dried tea specimens, uh, both at Kew Gardens, which has a fantastic herbarium, uh, and then also over in India, in Assam, I've looked at a herbarium there, and also Calcutta, where I grew up, has uh, one of the oldest herbaria in India, uh, which also contains tea uh, leaves. And there's something magical about seeing a pressed tea specimen. We're talking about the plant now, pressed, uh, that dates you know, back to, let's say, 1832, right, or 1830s. Uh, there's something also very fragile about them because they deteriorate really quickly. And if you think about it, they're dried, right? So uh, they're dead plants. Uh, so actually, that actually brings up, um, now that, that I'm thinking about it, yes, strange object. Well, let's go to the strange <laughs> object. Also, when we're talking Perfect. about death, uh, so the chapter that I'm working on for my book right now involves wild animals and tea plantations. And I am working on taxidermy. So I would say the strangest objects that I have come across in tea culture are actually quite macabre. Uh, they're stuffed tiger heads, which tea planters shot in the 19th century. Um, and they glare at you from their walls. I grew up in a tea planting family. And I remember we had this tiger skin growing up as a child in uh, the, the part of uh, India where my family had their family home. And we were terrified of it as children because the tigers, you know, the Royal Bengal tiger is huge to start with. And the head was the size of a football. I mean, I'm talking about a real, I mean, not American football, like soccer ball, I guess. And it, it seemed gigantic to a child. So I think that's the strangest object that I would say um, I've encountered in my tea research. Uh, and it's great fun to actually go down these roads because you realize they're all connected back to the plant itself. <laughs> Um, and even with the herbarium specimens, and this is something I forgot to mention in my talk, you know, I, note, I flagged the flower for you. For a botanist, the flower is a very important uh, part of verifying the plant as the camellia species. For a tea planter, however, if the tea bush flowers, it's considered a plant in distress. So you don't want the tea bush to flower. In fact, the tea plant actually grows up to about 15 feet high. It's a tree, literally. 
and uh, it's pruned down. So when you look at images, like you have, for instance, behind Tim, you've got those hedges, right? You've got those rows of tea bushes. Those have literally, it's like a bonsai uh, concept of making sure that the tea bushes are at chest height so that the plucker can pluck. But ordinarily they would be allowed to grow all the way up to 15 feet high. Some plantations, if they're large enough, will have what we call a seed bari, where they grow tea or allow tea to grow up to full height and they can harvest the tea seeds from it. So the flower has a very interesting history for the botanist as well as for the planter, both coming at it from a botanical history point of view, actually, right? Great. But very different approaches. Perfect. Well, I hate to do this. I know that um, I got through as many of the questions as we could, but I don't want us to go too over uh, knowing that depending on your time zone, it's probably your dinner uh, or maybe it's afternoon tea time. Uh, depending on what coast you're joining us from. And an extra thanks to Tim, who is uh, incredibly late uh, over in London, and he was still willing to be a part of this event. So we greatly appreciate that. Uh, it's so time for tea. Yes, yes, time for tea. Um, so thank you again to all three of our speakers this evening. This was so fun. We obviously could go on for hours talking about all aspects of tea. Uh, so we appreciate everyone joining us tonight. Again, please take a look at the chat. Kate has popped in all of those helpful links a couple of times. And in the next few minutes, you'll also receive a survey email. We'd love to get your feedback. We continually build out creative and different orange experiences for our Syracuse University alumni here at the Office of Alumni Engagement and love to hear what you liked and what you disliked and what you were really thought was fun and different. Uh, we do take all your input as we plan future programs. And in that email, we'll also again have the link to our special teas to start sipping document that's right online for you. So you can maybe do some tea shopping and use some great discounts for the Republic of Tea and Maruwin Tea Company. And then uh, last but certainly not least, please continue to uh, stay engaged and stay in touch. We have lots of great events coming up. We mentioned about how wine pairings and tea pairings have so many similarities. We have a wonderful wine uh, pairing event uh, in lieu of Valentine's Day coming up on February 9th that we invite you to join us for as an orange experience. We also have a Q's cardio class in February. And last but certainly not least, we invite you to uh, celebrate Valentine's Day with us. And we'll actually be doing an orange love celebration with a vow renewal ceremony and orange love certificate and all kinds of other fun things that you can do as you figure out how do we have fun and celebrate Valentine's Day at home this year. Uh, so we're there for you whenever we can be um, and really appreciate you joining us for tonight's orange experience. Thanks so much and go orange.